We want to turn to the Word and we want to start with Jeremiah chapter 29 and we're going to uh, go straight into verse 10 of Jeremiah chapter 29. And it says there, For here is what Adonai says, After 70 years are over, I will come to you and I will fulfill my good word to you by bringing you back to this place. For I know what plans, the uh, concept there is also plans, what thoughts I have, in mind for you, says Adonai, plans for shalom and not for evil, so that you might have a hope and a future. Um, I can see the screens up here. There we go. <clears throat> and it says, And then you will pray, call to me and pray to me, and I will listen. The Hebrews, I will shema to you, and then you will seek me, and you will find me, provided you seek for me wholeheartedly. And I will let you find me, says Adonai. And I will reverse your exile and gather you from all the nations and the places where I've driven you, says Adonai, and bring you back to the place from which I exiled you. And we ask, Abba, that you would let our minds, our hearts, and uh, just our ruach be open to what you are saying to us. There's many things that go on in our world that uh, cause us to lose focus and question where is our hope, where is our future, what's happening in our world. 2020 has proved to be a fun year so far. COVID-19 coming in, all its related agendas and lockdowns and government incompetence and government corruptions and elections maybe not turning out how some people want them and threats from countries of our north. And as uh, Mark said before about the USA election debacle, which is still ongoing while we go to air here, calamity in so many countries of the world, Israel in, sh in shutdown and still threatened by so many of the neighbours. And if you think 2020 was bad, remember 2021 was when Mad Max was set. So maybe we need to pray for that year before it even gets here. There's many in our community that sadly facing serious medical diagnosis and job loss and income loss due to the lockdown and family, even marriage crisis, personal meltdowns happening. We need to all stop and refocus and hear God's hope for us and that God has got a future for us. Before turning to the text, we need to examine the context within here so we can understand why God is saying these words. Jeremiah is declaring God's words to prepare Israel for what's going to happen in their future when they're in Babylon uh, under exile. Ex Israel's about to be exiled. In Jeremiah's time, he's prophesying of what's going to happen. They'll be exiled to Babylon because they turn from their one true God to go after pagan gods. Israel uh, uh, is going to be exiled out of their promised land. They've forfeited the right to Eretz Israel because of their disobedience. And they would be in an impossible situation without hope of restoration or future return to their promised land. They'd be like they'd return to the hopeless state of their forefathers locked there in Egypt. The temple and the land would be destroyed and would lay in ruins in absolute devastation as Jeremiah was to write in the beginning of Lamentation where it says, how lonely lies the city that was once so full of people. And those left behind in the land would not have desire or drive to rebuild. They also would be without hope and without a sense of future. I pray that you've never been in such devastating context without a hope or a future. I pray you haven't because I have been there. A loss of position due to betrayal of close friends and a loss of ministry, losing my wife to cancer, there sitting alone in a large house thinking how lonely lies the city that was once, or the house that was once so full of people. No hope, no future, no concept of anything returning to life again. They're locked in the perfect storm. But God, but God. Always remember those words. Anna also had levels of devastations and loss in her life. But God. And this passage spoke to us both as we met in our journey towards each other, having a new hope and a new future together and with Adonai. 
and we pray that they would bless you. First of all, we go to God's promise of restoration in, 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 in chapter 29, verse 10. For here is what Adonai says. After 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise. In, in the literal Hebrew is my good word to bring you back to this place. Three promises are here. I will come to you. I'll perform, perform my good word to you. I will cause you to return. In other words, restoration. The, there's a Jewish prodigal son story where the son uh, is, is away from the father and the father calls out the son, come back to me. And the son says, I cannot come back to you. And the father says, well, come as far as you can and I will come the rest of the way for you. This is the words here of Jeremiah and God through Jeremiah. God is a promise-making God, a promise-keeping God. He promises that he will come to us. Great theologian Karl Barth said, it's the grace of God that comes to us and draws us back to God. Karl Barth also said, God refuses to be God without us. He wants to be with us. God wants us to be with him more than what we often want to be with him. God promises, and within that promise is judgment will happen, but so will restoration, which is God's ultimate purpose. The tension of a righteous God, uh, of bringing both judgment and restoration at the appropriate times. I will fulfill, I will do my good word, my gracious promise to you, the promise of restoration. From that there of, of uh, personal experience, the restoration can often be different to our original state. They have a good meme that uh, is trying to come up on the screen, but not yet. Um, there about when you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person as you walked into the storm. That's what the storm is all about. Blessing will bring change to us. And it's designed to, to bring us closer and transform us more into God's image. God coming to us restores our joy, our laughter, and brings us back to the music that is within our hearts. There in verse, uh, uh, second point here in verse 11, his perspective, God's purpose for us. For I know the plans and thoughts that I have in mind for you, says Adonai, plans for shalom, not for calamity. The Hebrew literally says evil, so that you can have a hope and you can have a future. The words, for I know, God already knows. He lives outside of time. He's already been in our future and he knows the game plan to get us out of where we are currently locked into. And here is evidence of the reality. God already had Israel's future exit game plan before they even went to Babylon. And that's why he says, you need to know the thoughts and plans that I think. In other words, don't go by your own understanding. Can't view our situation by how we see it, but how God sees our world. And get God's perspective on what we are facing. How does God see that medical diagnosis? How does he see that financial situation? The family crisis, the, the jobs, the <clears throat> that of trauma that we're facing. Understand there's nothing in our world, nothing in our world that's caught God out by surprise. Not this COVID, not government things, not elections, not our crisis that we're going through. None of it has caught God out by surprise. And that's why we need to get God's perspective and God's purpose for the issues that we are facing. And there's twofold there. First of all, that of shalom, not of evil. Many people in exile would feel that evil has been done to them. No, it's shalom coming to you. God's shalom is wholeness in our world that empowers us that we might be able to get through the present situations with that shalom, that peace, that wholeness in our hearts. Shalom is God's gift of grace to them there in the exile, the ability to hold on until their full hope is fully realized. Humans bring evil when we disobey God's ways. God brings us shalom and restoration from the evil. And secondly, there that I give you a future and I give you a, give you a hope and a future. God does not want us to live in despair. Please understand that. He doesn't want us to live in a place of turmoil, <clears throat> a place of devastation. 
God does not want us to live our life where we cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel or live in fear that the light we see at the end of the tunnel is actually a train heading straight for us. The answer should always be Messiah Yeshua, the light of the world. He is the one who declared it. Please remember, God is still on the throne no matter what is happening in our lives or elsewhere in this world. Even if evil is happening in this world, God is still God. And God will impart, impart his hope and his future into our hearts. <clears throat> the Israeli national anthem, the Hatikva, the hope. We uh, <clears throat> was joking here in the office recently uh, about that. And I said to uh, um, Sharon, uh, one of the team members here, about the national anthem, because we were discussing, I said, it's the only anthem in the world that I know that has snot in the middle of it. And she said, oh my goodness, I thought you were going to come up with something profound, like the national anthem is one of the few national anthems of the world, or the main one there, that has no war, words of war within it. It's just hope, our hope. It was written in 1878. Uh, by uh, Naftali Imber, who was born in some place in Poland that I still can't pronounce, although my wife has tried to help me with numerous pronunciations, went under Austrian rule. In 1897, the first Zionist Congress, um, head, headed uh, by Theodore Herzl, declared <clears throat> the, um, this has been the anthem even before the state of Israel came along. People in the Jewish people in the late 1800s were without hope and without a future. Theodore Herzl, there who headed up that first Zionist Congress in 1897, started to give hope and a future to the Jewish people by saying within five years, definitely within 50 years, there will be a Jewish state sparked that hope and future and the Jewish people began to leave their countries from the north and out of other areas, uh, even in the Middle East, and gathered there to win towards uh, into Eretz Israel, just as they did <clears throat> 2,500 years beforehand from Babylon. And again in modern times, in the 1940s, Israel and the Holocaust was again without hope and without a future. But understand at the worst moment of evil of the Holocaust, God is still on the throne Still with the game plan, the game plan was there will be a state of Israel and we saw that come into reality. The same thing for us. God already has a game plan for the crises that we are going through to give us shalom, not evil. Give us hope and give us a future. Remember the Bible remains God's word in the midst of the worst evil you could ever face and we can open the pages and hear God's thoughts and plans for us. Thirdly, our response, verse 12, and you will call to me and pray to me and I will listen. The Hebrew word there is shema. I will listen to you. Call to me. Uh, the, the Hebrew has the call to shout, to even proclaim. And our response to whatever we're going through should be to proclaim God's perspective, hearing from God his perspective and then proclaiming God's perspective. We begin the God conversation again, discussing everything with God, hearing God, what his answer is, and then proclaiming God's answers into the world. Understand, it's like a loving father waiting for children to repent, to say sorry, so that love can restore and rebuild our lives. Israel in Babylon had to decide that God is God. Their God is the only one true God, not the other false and pagan gods that had caused the exile. Daniel read this in Babylon and we find this in Daniel chapter 9 verse 2 and it lit him up reading this very passage said 70 years are up we need to get on our face before God hear from God get that hope get that future and pursue the ways of God with the whole heart. He fired up the nation to pray and to repent. The question is, what will it take us to respond appropriately to God's word and to fire up our walk with God? He says, I will shema, I will listen, I will go along with you. He's waiting for us to call, ready to shema, listen to us in partnership. The answer, folks, is not who wins various elections or whatever that medical diagnosis may be or whatever that financial situation or issue that you're facing is the answer is God we need to spend time with God hearing his perspective hearing his words 
into our life and into our world. Fourthly, we go into verse 13. It says, when you seek me, or then you will seek me, and you will find me, provided you seek me wholeheartedly. We find God's perspective and answer by us turning toward him and seeking him with our entire hearts, with all that we are, everything behind us. And we will apprehend God if we seek everything with a total wholeheartedness. The Lord is Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. We have to remember that. We will not apprehend God's reality for us unless we are totally sincere and totally exclusively focused on God alone. There's an echo here of Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 1 to 3 where Moses prophesied all those years before that Israel would do the wrong thing and would be in a foreign land but God will return them back to Eretz Israel if, if, if they turn back to God and if they obey with all their hearts and with all their lives. God knows our future and he has the game plan ready for us to turn to him wholeheartedly and totally partner with him. God cannot and will not disperse restoration and covenant blessings to a rebellious people who still keep doing the same evil that caused their exile and caused the things that we face. The condition of occupancy in the land is obedience. As with us, we need to walk in obedience to receive our hope and to receive our future. <clears throat> Finally, and fifthly here, we find God gives us in verse 14 four different I wills. First of all, I will. Let you find me, says Adonai. Here's actually a divine romance theme that comes out of the scriptures. And so often we find this divine, divine romance going on. I will let you find me, that little bit of elusive, elusiveness, but you will find me. Then secondly, I will reverse your exile. And thirdly, I will bring, gather you, kibbutz you, gather you from all the nations and places that I have driven you, says Adonai. And fourthly, an implied I will bring you back to the place from where I exit, exiled you, that is, that there of the uh, uh, land of Israel. God can and wants to do all these four things for you to give you a hope and a future that we might go forward. The question is, will we, will you answer that divine romance call and come and accept Yeshua as being Messiah, God's gift of love sent to us. That's what it's all about, folks. May you find God's perspective <clears throat> in whatever uh, 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 storm or crisis that you uh, are facing, find a hope and future. Brueggemann, writing on this very passage, says, God is available in the midst of despair and will override the despair and the circumstances that generate it. A.W. Tozer the great phrase that you need to put in your heart, while it looks like things are out of control, behind the scenes there is a God who has not surrendered his authority. Folks, there is a hope, there is a future, and it's found in God through Yeshua, the Messiah. After chapter 29 goes in chapter 30, and then chapter 31 talks about the promise of a new covenant, which is the ultimate of our hope and the ultimate of our future. God has stated many I wills. But how many I wills will you give back to God? 